Thank you, everybody. It's, it's really a great honor to be part of your workshop and, and uh, actually learning, learning to know a little bit about your really exciting new program that you are planning. I'm here uh, today to talk about the program that we have been running uh, a bit over two years now uh, in Finland around 6G. And uh, I'll tell you some of our, our um, key principles in, 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 in our program, why we have been selecting certain research themes, and, and also a little bit about our visions towards the future. So, as we all know, we are now uh, witnessing uh, a really a major change in, in wireless community and applications and actually whole society where we have a huge amount of possibilities by utilizing efficiently um, data provided by different types of devices and, and uh, sources to utilize it intelligently to make our society a better place to live. And of course, this is really happening already in previous generations, and we know that uh, uh, everything is going to be uh, speeded up with future future generations of wireless technologies and also other related technologies like whatever is happening in AI AI area, to give you an example. Um, we started our program in May 2018 and have been quite active ever since. On the left-hand side, you can see some of the key figures that we were collecting for, for midterm reporting uh, last year. Uh, we are focusing our research in four major areas where the first one, wireless connectivity, is probably the largest one and where, where we are most likely best known of at Center for Wireless Communications. And um, then the second one, devices and circuits. Third one, distributed computing and service and applications is the fourth one. We feel that we have to look at all these different aspects in order to be uh, able to to decide and, and guess what will be the critical technology enablers towards the future. As we know, when we are moving to higher and higher uh, spectrum bands, we have new challenges related to transceiver implementation, uh, making those devices real, implementing the devices, um, and uh, um, also, we have lots of challenges related to materials, how we how we make, for example, antennas to radiate at extremely high frequencies. Um, we know that there's lots of sensory type of devices coming up, there's a huge oh, amount of I, data. I, I, think, I, th I think your slides are not advancing. Uh, could you please check your presentation? Uh, and we see your uh, PowerPoint, not in the presentation mode. Okay, let me let me go back and check what's going on. <clears throat> can you see the slides now? Uh, we can see the PowerPoint, but not in the presentation. I think that would help. Do you see them? Um, no, not really. We see them, Mati, but I'm wondering if you could do like a slideshow view. We it is, it is, it is on my screen slideshow mode, but, but there, there is a there's a problem because the um, the Zoom version that I have on my laptop is not supported by this uh, WinLab Zoom, and I'm running it through a web browser. And um, that's probably causing the problems now. But I should say that, Yasaman, if you could keep changing the slides for me from the PDF I sent you yeah, uh, half an hour ago, that should work. Give me one second, one second. Sorry about this. Maybe I can keep talking in the meanwhile. So, um, so uh, there are lots of lots of challenges related also to materials and distributed computing um, is is going to be in the crowd part since we have a lot of lot of uh, different types of devices and networks around us, and um, this capability of edge computing 
has to be realized much more efficiently. And also, yeah, that's it. Now I'm at the slide number three. Um, and, and edge computing is really a great enabler for future fantastic applications that we are seeing. Then the fourth area, the next one, that one, yes. Uh, the fourth research area, services and applications, is extremely important and, and probably not addressed well enough by research community, currently at least. There are lots of techno-economic analysis related to this, and, and what we are trying to do is that we are looking for alternative uh, um, business models compared to current uh, mobile network operator dominated area where the rights to operate the network come through the fact that we have nationwide um, spectrum licenses for for um, large coverage area networks. And, and, um, and now that we are seeing, for example, what's happening in 5G uh, spectrum licensing processes all around the world is that we are talking more and more about local spectrum licensing policies where we can, for example, have a private network for a, for a factory or whatever facility whatever reason we want to have it. And that's happening already at 3.5 gig, uh, 26 gig, and, and definitely more so to higher frequencies we are moving moving to. And uh, we developed years back um, a micro operator, uh, uh, operator concept where, where local spectrum licensing is the key. And that type of things we are doing uh, at increasing speed and, and um, uh, sometimes even upsetting our good old friend mobile network operators who would like to keep the status quo in, in the business models. And next one, please. So if you look at uh, a little bit back in, in mobile technologies history, we all know that first we had voice-oriented systems for maybe 20 years, and then with 3G and 4G, we, we had this fantastic ability to access internet through mobile phones, and mobile broadband really was the, was the major driving force um, uh, behind different mobile applications. Now we are already living through a fifth generation uh, enrollment, and uh, at this time, lots of new things are connected wirelessly to be part of, part of um, internet. And there's a lot of intelligence also around us uh, we have great power of AI type of, of algorithms, which can really um, dig out a lot of useful information from huge amounts of data for the benefit of our, day, for our daily lives. So we are really seeing a transition of, of uh, a value chains as well. We are seeing that more and more um, uh, different vertical application areas are, are really pushing forward to deploy wireless technologies to, to make their fields um, more profitable, more efficient, and, and let's say less uh, physical labor uh, um, requiring uh, to, to change their fields, for example, in agricultural domain, to give you one example. But at the early phases of 5G, we have already seen that probably we don't understand well enough what are really uh, the bottlenecks in, in deploying uh, wireless technologies in these new areas uh, in, in massive scale and in a holistic way. And uh, there are also some regulative obstacles that we have to start to uh, take down in order to make it happen. For example, we are not even close to having automated driving, fully automated driving in place with the current legislation. And of course not, because the technology is not quite ready for it. But at each and every important vertical area, we should understand better what are the obstacles, how do we need to change them to, to uh, really take everything out of 5G. And this development is ongoing with 6G. And like I said in the title, the value chains are really changed at much longer cycles compared to uh, mobile technology cycles, which are 10 years. The next one, please. Um, then still looking at a little bit backwards, um, this, this little bit busy slide lists few things that were, were discussed a lot in European research community, at least. Um, at the time when 5G research activities were, were starting to, 
speed up in 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 Europe. And um, then we all know that we have this famous Fauci triangle. What came out of it in the end? But and looking at that, many of these targets and promises uh, are, are still not yet met. And and um, as we know, it takes quite a bit of time to make these new breakthroughs reality uh, in commercial systems at affordable prices and and at the re with the reliability that is required required by consumers. And um, but besides this ongoing 5G development, there are already now we can see that. There are quite a few um, areas that were not addressed sufficiently in, in 5G, like, for example, really accurate positioning, especially in indoor environment, but also everywhere. And maybe also uh, um, communication signals based imaging, radio imaging as well. Um, when looking at, at the role of digital services for whole humankind, we understand that since uh, about half of the of the humankind is, is is not within the um, internet connectivity today. So we have quite a bit of work still to be done to connect the rest of the world, first of all, to, to be part of internet at at least at very uh, rudimentary level. But also in, in developed societies, we have lots of uh, uh, geographical areas where connectivity is, is either non-existing or uh, very bad quality. So we have to address this much more. And then um, when we look at uh, key characteristics of 5G, we really see that that there are lots of major developments still need, needs to be done. These um, uh, highly advertised network sliding, slicing, solving all vertical needs doesn't seem to be really sufficient for all verticals. For example, when we look at these ultra reliable low latency communications area, uh, I don't think we 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 have yet technically um, cap capable enough solutions for many vertical areas where, where that would be really needed. And and slicing definitely is not the way to go. Um, then looking at a little bit radio technologies and uh, these multi-antenna schemes, millimeter wave communications, um, the device cost and energy efficiency of, of radio transceivers is not yet at the level that they should be in the end of the day. And there's huge amount of development and room for for innovations there. So many things that we need to keep developing, uh, even looking backwards, like seven eight years, what we were targeting five G four. So there's huge amount of work still to be done, even there. Next one, please. Um, one example about this uh, uh, understanding regulative regulative uh, restrictions for for a massive scale and holistic verticals deployment is is discussed a little bit here. This is our guess from 2015 when we were trying to make our bet on what will happen with 5G in terms of what the, what part of spectrum will be utilized and how we gradually move towards higher spectrum bands even above 100 gigahertz. And it uh, looks like our, our guess was not completely wrong. And, uh, and uh, also, we were speculating at that time already about this local spectrum licensing. And, and it looks like the best parts of spectrum below 3.5 gig, they are mainly auctioned to, to uh, commercial operators. But there's plenty of good parts of spectrum um, around, uh, let's say, about 10 gigahertz and definitely even all the way up to 100 plus gigahertz, where we can have um, different licensing mechanisms where also radio propagation characteristics would, would speak strongly for it, that a local, local spectrum assignment would be probably making much more sense than, than uh, large-scale um, uh, licenses. And uh, really, we do believe that innovative and flexible spectrum regulation policy is the most important key to innovate, future innovations related to mobile wireless communications. And, and, and they, that's basically what your new initiative is all about, which, which is def definitely a great thing. Uh, next one, please. Then um, looking at what are the critical drivers pushing 
6G forward and, and, and justifying it. Uh, I already mentioned about this uh, coverage challenge, and uh, it's really about digital inclusion targets that that uh, digital societies, they are really calling for connectivity from anywhere we are moving around and, and, and so on. Also, um, United Nations Sustainability Development Goals are necessitating to have global coverage in order to try to solve those 17 different problem areas or challenges that they have laid down. Um, Business is going to be totally different. Uh, the stakeholders will be uh, changing quite a bit from, from the one it has been traditionally. There will be different ecosystems around critical vertical uh, sectors. Of course, um, the uh, infrastructure providers and operators remain there in most of the cases, not necessarily in all cases, always, but um, bringing in the vertical sector players like automotive industry or, or energy sector or health healthcare sector, whatever it is that we are, we are concerned about, should be brought in and um, those will then figure out what is the most efficient way to, to uh, uh, have value created for every player in the ecosystem. And uh, that will require uh, area-specific regulative changes, and, and that will also change ownership of networks and customers. That will change also uh, who will provide services and, and to whom at, at different situations. If this, this vision is true, then we will start to have uh, lots of different um, private type of networks, not necessarily closed, they can be also open, like shopping center or shopping mall type of systems where the customers need to access the, 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 the network at, at the mall area. But anyways, there will be a huge number of new players in different vertical areas, bringing in lots of concerns about data privacy and security issues, which should not be undermined and, and is really critical and important to tackle. Then about radio technology uh, drivers and, and challenges. Uh, I think the uh, biggest potential is in really super efficient, rather short range connectivity at high spectrum bands. Whatever this short means, let's let's say maximum few hundred meters or so, and at increasing speed, the networks are going to build close to the consumers' users, and uh, meaning in indoor environment, in in uh, uh, vehicles and so forth and so forth, where the range uh, definitely can be much shorter compared to outdoor micro networks. Um, artificial intelligence and machine learning definitely is, is uh, going to change the way we are, first of all, using the applications, what types of applications we are using. Uh, the applications will be context uh, dependent. So we will have different service offerings depending on where we are in the network, what we are doing. Are we at free time or work or shopping, doing some sports or whatever? Then finally, the biggest driver for sure for the next generation is eventually the standards. And there is a standard every 10 years so far. And uh, now that we look at the geopolitical situation, things are quite dramatically different compared to the time when we were starting 5G research about 10 years ago, when global collaboration was, was strongly emphasized and, and the world was moving, uh, let's say, at, at least in the better harmony towards the same goals. Now we have bipolar bipolar situation and, and uh, we have to understand that there are different forces pulling development to different directions and they may have different reasonings for developing 6G, but uh, still I believe and many of us hopefully believe that global standard is the only way to move forward if, if, the, if we cannot keep uh, moving along ITU uh, uh, goals, eventually they will, they will lay down 20, 30, IMT 2030 system requirements, which will be pro most likely processed again in three GPP standards process. I think uh, the, the um, pulling to different directions is not going to help anybody in the end. Next one, please. 
So we had a big exercise uh, about a year ago. Um, it was right uh, uh, around the time when the COVID pandemic was spre spreading like crazy and started to spread. We actually made this exercise of, of drafting and first of all, identifying 12 critical areas that we found important in, in terms of 6C research. And then we um, set up an expert group looking at different aspects related to 6G research, looking at primarily different technology areas, but looking at also uh, sustainability targets and business potential and new value chain related things. And uh, we came up with 12 white papers of different sorts. And I'm, I'm now going to review some of the major or let's say high level outcomes of those. Next one, please. So to start with, um, even doing research towards next generation mobile networks, we have to have common understanding that what are the key drivers towards it? What are the key technical drivers towards it? And uh, since we have had these all the time for previous generations, um, eventually with some numerical target values, and uh, so those are still valid for, for 6G. We just have to figure out what are the exact targets for throughputs or latencies or reliabilities and so forth. Uh, but at the same time, um, we were thinking that we have to look at also key values. So a little bit soft side of the story that why are we going to develop these and what are the... Uh, not so easily numerically describable uh, targets for the next generation system like transparency or, or privacy and trust issues or, or uh, how do these uh, UN uh, sustainability development goals uh, um, come into play and, and open source related issues and that type of things. And those were discussed as well at, at high level. And we still feel that those are extremely th important things to include for the next generation visions. Next one. So, of course, um, since we are all engineers, most of us at least, uh, we love technology, we love radio technology in particular, and, and of course, we need to have challenging goals for our research uh, uh, targeting at, at 2030 mobile technologies. and. Uh, of course, everything has to be uh, bigger, uh, uh, higher performance compared to the previous one. And, and we are all aware of, of all these different target values and where it could be. And, and, and eventually, uh, ITU will, will have 60 um, performance requirements defined roughly two years from now, if I don't recall it completely wrong. As we already saw in, in the case of 5G, uh, many of the requirements are totally contradictory. For example, if we, if we look, try to remember this 5G triangle with extreme mobile broadband, um, uh, mission critical communications and massive deplo massively deployed uh, sensors, they actually pull the uh, performance and design targets to completely different directions and there's no way we can keep designing systems in a harmonized way to satisfy all these different needs. So it will mean more and more in the future so that we will have customized solutions for specific needs when we are really requiring extreme performance uh, values of the system. Uh, that's definitely going to happen. And it will be interesting to see how um, these different uh, targets will be harmonized even loosely to the same uh, uh, system concept. Next one, please. <coughs> um, here we have uh, a few examples about um, some key vertical areas. And, and uh, the, the, the study group made an analysis of uh, certain assumption about typical applications you might imagine in these different vertical areas 
and uh, then they 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 wrote down what are the typical technical target values of different sorts for these verticals and and just by glancing through these different different uh, um, uh, parameter sets we see that the variance is is really amazingly large and uh, this also kind of shows you that uh, it's it will be more and more difficult in the future to have a harmonized system concept satisfying all these different needs next one please so broadband connectivity has been the main driver so far in previous generations and and most likely will remain to be so also in the future and then uh, um, the group of experts they were really digging into what what has been uh, um, uh, what has the research community been doing in different promising areas that we we are well aware of and and actually Surprisingly, there is nothing uh, dramatically new in terms of transmission techniques, not even in single processing um, algorithmic side of the story, how we could make this gigantic leap like 10 or 100 times uh, faster uh, uh, connectivity uh, from, from these, uh, uh, these perspectives. Of course, there are new promising areas. If we take this MIMO to the next levels, these intelligent reflecting surfaces, etc., etc., etc. The concepts are well known, but and and uh, but the, the real challenges are in implementation issues, like in many other things as well. If we think about, for example, terahertz or sub terahertz uh, uh, radio technologies, it's all about implementation challenge. It's not so much of radio concept challenge. If you think about uh, extremely accurate positioning for the future, possibly utilizing uh, high frequencies like sub terahertz, it's all about implementation challenge, not about communication concept or algorithm challenge. Next one, please. So uh, machine type communications is of course, one of the increasing new, new trends and in, very interesting and uh, Besides this 5G triangle, we have to look at uh, different efficiency parameters like energy and cost efficiency. Uh, there are lots of, of issues related to um, security, privacy and trust issues and, and authentication mechanisms. And of course, um, then uh, having the sensing capability in that kind of uh, environments and scenarios. Positioning is mentioned in many places as one of the key enablers for future interesting application areas. Next one, please. So positioning really uh, uh, interesting is the high frequency part of the spectrum that really enables us elegant way to have accurate accurate um, uh, beamforming and, and pinpointing. And uh, of course, uh, uh, the higher the frequency band is, the more easy it is to, is to uh, provide accurate positioning uh, theoretically of course, there are other ways to do it. But positioning, if it's really realized uh, in combination with the, um, the next generation communication concept, so the communication signals providing accurate positioning, that would really open up uh, a completely new uh, area for application space. And, and uh, uh, for sure would open new new uh, page at a uh, mobile industry businesses as well. So a lot of challenges there, but the biggest, biggest, biggest challenges are again implementation and how do we make the radio transceivers uh, affordable and, and energy efficient. So now we can probably jump over the next one and go to, yeah, jump over that. So finally, I would like to talk about one really exciting project that actually was started exactly a month ago, this HexaX European 6 chip project, which is uh, uh, led by Nokia and Ericsson, a consortium of 25 partners, looking at all critical aspects related to 6G, looking at, at all those issues that I mentioned earlier, and is trying to develop independent technology enablers making eventually 6G system possible. This is two and a half year project. This is early phase research. This is not going to develop a totally unified 6G system concept, but just looking at the building blocks uh, 
and increasing the awareness and understanding what direction to go in the in the in the next coming years. And uh, before I, I conclude my talk, I would like to encourage uh, uh, increasing collaboration between between um, six G flagship and and uh, different uh, partners in the US. We have had a tradition of collaborative projects uh, in joint programs with NSF and Academy of Finland since 2013. Now there is a new solicitation which is open now. It's a CISE uh, core program. It's a little bit small program, but anyways, it's focusing on AI and wireless technologies. And um, from the beginning of this year, our Ministry of Education allocated a huge amount of money, 10 million euros, for collaborative activities between Finnish universities and US universities. And uh, 6G wireless is one of the three major areas for targeted collaboration. So if you are keen on, on trying to figure out how to collaborate in the future, please contact us and uh, you can find our contact information from 6G flagship web pages. And the final slide concludes my talk and I would like to thank you all for your attention.